Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Emma, and I'm here with Jenna, and we're going to present today on handwriting from the 1800s. Um, just a couple of things. We will do a Q&A at the end, so just save your questions till the end. There is no chat tonight, so at the end, you can unmute or raise your hand, and we'll do questions that way. Just save them till the end. Um, and then we are recording, and I will email out the recording to everyone um, later this week. Also, if you look at our, if you find our YouTube channel and subscribe to us, you'll get an alert when we post it as well. And then again, please just stay muted. Um, really quickly, who are we? Why are we giving this webinar? Um, Backlog is my company. Um, we're an archival consulting firm. We're based in St. Louis. And then we really help smaller institutions bridge the digital divide, meaning connect to their connect their collections to their communities online, bring some, some digital assets online. Um, so we do archival consulting. So we do archival needs assessments. We do policy and procedures writing. Um, we do some platform hosting. So we've set up several Omecas for smaller historical societies. And then additionally, we do um, genealogy research. So we really specialize in helping people break through brick walls. Um, so if you've got you know, just one generation and you can't connect to the next, that's the brick wall that we can help you get through or better document. Um, and I'm Emma. Um, I was a university archivist for five years before being laid off during the pandemic. Um, I kind of thought that there are places out there who needed a little bit of help, but not full-time help. And that's how Backlog got started. Um, and so our clients include places here in St. Louis, um, the Oklahoma Memorial, um, Oklahoma City Memorial in Oklahoma City, and then the John Wayne Museum in Iowa. So we're kind of spread across the Midwest. Um, and then I'm here with Jenna tonight. Hi, I'm, I'm actually not in St. Louis. I'm I'm way out east. Uh, so I was a university archivist for a long time, and I've recently uh, switched to be, being a museum archivist. So um, I've done a little bit of everything. And uh, one of the things I've had to do the most is figure out what on earth people are trying to say when they write things down. Uh, so I, I like to nerd out about handwriting. And so I am... Share, so I'm sharing my, I wouldn't say expertise, but my enthusiasm for handwriting. And hopefully I have some uh, some wisdom to impart and, and some anecdotes to impart. So uh, in this first slide, I just wanted to um, show two different handwriting styles. These are probably uh, written by two different people on the same page pretty close together. Uh, I took this photo at the National Library of Scotland this summer. Uh, and, and it just, it really goes to show that dating a document based on someone's handwriting is, uh, is, is, is a great goal to have, but it's not always possible because these two people were writing very differently, uh, but around the same time. Uh, and some of, some of the handwriting styles that I'm gonna talk about, are a little bit evident in uh, in this document. Uh, next slide, please. So my scope is uh, gonna be Europe and the Americas um, in the long 19th century, which is a term the historians use to refer to from the French Revolution to World War One-ish. That's kind of, that's kind of our period. Um, I, there are so many uh, calligraphic traditions in other cultures beyond uh, the West, you know, beyond the Europe and the, the Americas. I just don't have any experience with them. So that would be very much outside my lane. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on this time period. I did an earlier webinar earlier this year, uh, talking about a longer, still, still the same geographic area, but uh, a much longer time period starting from the Roman period uh, up, up until up through this period in the 20th century. But so much happened in the 19th century that we're really just focusing on this century uh, in, in this hour tonight. Uh, next slide, please. So our, our goal here is to, to do a lot of looking. Um, you know, don't worry about scribbling down a lot of notes or trying to come up with like means of identifying all of these different handwriting styles. We're just, we're gonna look and we're gonna try to familiarize our eyes with some different letter forms. And I wanna talk about some of the 
contextual changes that, uh, sorry, some of the contextual circumstances around the creation and development and use of some of these different handwriting styles. So this was a period of rapid technological change, um, in, both in pens and inks, but also the invention of the typewriter, um, the speed of business. So handwriting had to change in order to uh, be standardized and legible to a greater number of people, to be faster so that um, so that communication could happen more quickly and uh, to respond to Morse code. So there, there's a lot happening in the 19th century and people are really trying to figure out how to make their handwriting more efficient. Next slide, please. So just some terms and concepts before we get started. Paleography is the study of forms of historic writing systems. So it's not the study of the content, but of the, the way in which the writing happens. It's also the dating of manuscripts based on writing, but of course that, that isn't always um, super dependable. Uh, and also the deciphering of historical handwriting. And orthography is the set of norms regarding letter forms, spelling, punctuation, um, so it's also the way in which writing happens, but it's more, it's not the study of, you could, you could almost say that paleography is the study of orthography over time. Next slide, please. Majuscule and minuscule are the technical terms, uppercase and lowercase letters. Ascenders and descenders are the parts of a letter that um, ascend above or the, the sorry, the center line or uh, descend below the baseline. So like a lowercase h has an ascender that goes over the center line. A lowercase g generally has a descender that goes below the baseline, but a lowercase c has neither of those things. A ligature is the joining of letters in handwriting or print. So you might see in some prints, a lot of times like, uh, if you see a CT in something printed in the 18th or 19th century, they might be connected in a specific way, but also just the loops connecting letters in cursive, that's also a ligature. Next slide, please. So we're starting out in the beginning of the long 19th century, and people are writing using dip pens of various shapes. So it might look a little bit like this. This is probably a modern pen, uh, but you, you would start out with a quill, then there, uh, the metal nib, nib is, um, is developed. Uh, you have to physically dip your pen into ink every time you want to write something. And after a few letters, a few words, you've got to dip it in again. So that should, that really affects the rhythm of how you're writing. And, you know, people are writing um, in different ways for different purposes, whether it's um, for government documents, personal correspondence for business, is it um, religious writing or record keeping? Is it legal? Um, you know, earlier, earlier before this period, there were different handwriting styles for, uh, for government and legal and court documents. Uh, we're going to, we're going through a period of moving from completely natural based inks, usually from uh, vegetable, vegetal sources, um, sometimes animal sources, um, to the creation of synthetic inks. And, you know, obviously print had ex existed for a while by this point, but we are moving into the development of typewriting. Um, oh, and what I wanted to say about inks uh, also is that um, a lot of, a, a really common form of ink at the beginning of this time period is iron gall ink, which is, you know, involves uh, the mixture of, of some sort of iron with some sort of tannic acid. Um, it's usually blackish or brownish. It can be very acidic and eat through paper over time, but it was incredibly common. You can develop inks from um, nuts or uh, like uh, walnuts, for example. If you ever if you ever touch a walnut that's fallen on the ground, it's going to stain your fingers, and that's that's walnut stain. You can make ink from that. So we're moving from that uh, to the development of synthetic ink, um, and that's when we start to get colors, and it's very exciting. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about cursive, um, that really can mean a, a multitude of different things. 
Uh, but the point of cursive is that um, generally the writer doesn't have to pick up the pen as often. Uh, so it's you get a much smooth, you get a, a smoother writing experience, a smoother reading experience, hopefully. Um, ligatures, as I mentioned, or loops connect the letters. Um, loops are specifically what occur in the ascenders and descenders. Uh, and um, oh, this picture here is also from the National Library of Scotland. Um, it is in Gaelic, so don't try it. <laughs> don't try to understand it. It's not in English. Um, so you know, there are there are so many different types of writing that can be considered cursive. And so there's not, so we're going to be talking about very specific hands or specific styles of generally cursive writing. Um, but cursive means a lot of different things. Next slide, please. So you know, what we think of as cursive began to come into use in the 1700s, but it wasn't standardized, as you can see here. Um, in the 1800s, uh, before the invention of the typewriter, really neat cursive handwriting was used for business as well as personal writing, and several hands were developed specifically for business writing. Um, and the first, so we're not, we don't start typing until really not the last quarter of the 19th century. Uh, the first commercially successful, broadly used typewriter was created in 1868. Uh, there were a lot of different variations on typing machines in, in different shapes and styles. Uh, Remington produced its first in 1873, Underwood around the same time. Um, Underwoods became more popular towards the end of the century, uh, but Remingtons are what uh, popularized the QWERTY keyboard that we still use today. So that's really the, the beginning of the modern TypeScript. Uh, next slide, please. So. Like, like I said, different styles of cursive. Um, you might see as you if you if you nerd out like me and you really want to get into the history of calligraphy, you might see continuous cursive described as being different from cursive, and they are technically different. There's slightly different standards regarding do you start the letter um, at the baseline or in the center? Where do you finish a letter or a word? It's very, very technical. We don't want to get in the weeds, but uh, sometimes you will see continuous cursive included in this timeline of, of hands. Next slide, please. So even though we're starting in you know, the late 17th, 1700s, early 1800s, the legacy of cursive handwriting goes back a little bit further. Uh, the hands that we're going to talk about evolve out of round hand or copper plate. A lot of times now you'll see this style of writing referred to as copper plate because it was reproduced in print by printing on copper plates. So, you know, if you're getting, uh, say, fancy wedding invitations done in a traditional, in a traditional press, it would be on copper plates. So uh, this style uses a metal pointed nib for those really fine lines. Earlier italic scripts use a square nib. So if you look at earlier forms of writing in like the medieval period, the, the, square, the, the, the square nib makes um, much more dramatic lines. Um, and the, in copper plate or round hand, there's a heavy contrast between your thick and thin strokes. Um, and so this was, as I said, very foundational for um, the hands that would uh, develop later. Next slide, please. So as, as I said, um, we're moving from a square tipped pen to a, a metal nib. Um, and some people were still using uh, feather quills. So it wasn't like everyone switched to a metal nib immediately. Uh, this picture is um, a fountain pen with a metal nib. Um, so a lot of a lot of more the more the more drama you want, the pointier your pen tends to be. Um, and in the 19th century, we get fountain pens. So where the ink is actually stored in a cartridge inside the pen, you don't have to physically dip your pen. So you get a, a smoother, less disjointed writing experience, you know, fewer ink, ink splatters. Um, you're not gonna have the ink start to run out at the end of the word right before, they, before some, the writer dips their pen back in. Um, so next slide, please. And then in the very late uh, 19th century, we get the ballpoint pen. So this is a macro view of the ballpoint pen. There's no point. 
So it was invented in 1888 um, and then further developed by the Hungarian brothers Laszlo and Georgi Biro, um, or it might be Biro, because in sometimes, especially like British people, you might hear them call a ballpoint pen a Biro. So that's just a ballpoint pen. It's like saying Kleenex. Uh, so they're all, a ballpoint pen is monoline, so it's not creating any difference between thick and thin lines as a nib would. So um, you're, the, just the style of writing is, uh, it looks so different because you're not getting any of that variation in thickness. Next slide, please. So uh, the first new hand we're going to talk about is Spencerian. So it's obviously based on round hand or copper plate. You can kind of see here that the letters are oval shaped a bit. Um, it was named after Platt Roger Spencer. So that so I when I first um, you know heard of Spencerian, I assumed it was related to like one of the poets. It's not. <laughs> Uh, so it's meant to be efficient, but also, but still maintaining some of that elegance. You can see the big swoops on the letters here, which is reminiscent of copper plate. Uh, they, uh, this style is still uses a pointed pen. Um, and this was standard in the United States from around 1850 to 1920. So even moving into the 20th century, you could still see this. Next slide, please. So this is just zoomed in. Um, you can really see the variation of thick and thin, the the, the swoops and loops uh, for for drama on the capital letters. Next slide, please. So, if you uh, in your archives or in your research are working with any German documents, you might see uh, materials written in current. Uh, so there, there's an excerpt here. So this is a this is a specifically a German hand that evolved out of black letter, which is when you think of like Gothic handwriting, quote unquote, we're going to do the air quotes. Uh, that is that is black letter. So it would have been done, you know, with a square point, very thick letters. Um, so this evolved out of that. Um, and this would be a, a late 1700s, early 1900s, excuse me, early 1800s uh, style of writing. And it influenced an, another hand called Sutterlin, which was sta which was standard in Germany from 1915 to 1950. So right after our sort of period of focus today. Next slide, please. So that's just a zoomed in of a uh, view of what that looks like. Next slide, please. And this is just an example of um, a doc this is a document written by George II of Britain and Handover because in the 1700s the British royals had um, a lot of German ancestry. Some actually grew up in Germany, so there are really two styles of writing going on here. There's some that looks more like current, um, and some, but then like the word palace, palace, uh, it looks much more like round hand. So you depending on the person writing and their life experience and how they learn to write, you might see archival documents that are kind of following a couple of different writing styles. And that's something always to keep in mind with any calligraphy or any handwriting. There are, there are sort of traditional letter forms in a, any particular style, but each individual person is going to have their own take on them. You know, a lot, any of us who learned cursive in school, might have you know our our cursive probably looked a lot alike when we were little but as we've gotten older we've learned to write in our own style and that's why our handwriting all looks different even though we might have started out with the same foundations next slide please so you might not see this much in archives but i thought i'd mention it library hand was developed uh by melville dewey so like the dewey decimal system and thomas edison um, it's very, very rounded and very straight at the same time. Uh, so this uh, was designed, was developed specifically for catalog cards. So the idea is that you're going to have really legible catalog cards. Um, and if you happen to maybe be doing research at, say, an Athenaeum that still has a, a working card catalog, um, you might be able, you might, you might see this. And you probably won't see it. Um, you know, in correspondence or docu or, or anything like that. But I think the development of this hand shows how much people were thinking about the uses of different styles of handwriting in this period and how people of many different fields and professions were thinking about 
how they could make styles of handwriting work best to meet their goals, essentially. Next slide, please. The Palmer method um, was a lot less elaborate than the Spencerian, um, and it was developed to facilitate translation to and from Morse code. Uh, so in, in, in a telegraph office, it's meant to be faster. And, and it you can kind of see in this example, uh, it's it just looks faster. <laughs> it looks like it, 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 it was written at speed. So it was developed by Austin Palmer um, in the 1880s, but it becomes a lot more common in the 1890s. And this was designed to be a form of business writing. Next slide, please. So um, it was faster to write because it allowed for using the muscles in your, in your arm, uh, not just, I don't know if you, my self view is just me like waving my arms around, but you're not just using your fingers. Um, you know, some of the older hands uh, require a lot of tension and precise movements in the hand, but in Palmer, it, it engages your whole arm. So uh, it was very foundational for styles of handwriting that came later in the 20th century, particularly what's called teaching scripts, um, like Danelian. Um, so those those are outside our scope of focus, but Danelian and, and a couple of other hands are what we probably learned in school. So th that kind of all goes back to Palmer. Next slide, please. So this is just the zoomed in. This is an example from his book on business writing. Uh, and you can see, it's a much less elaborate than um, than earlier hands, um, and is meant to uh, transcribe at speed. <laughs> Next slide, please. So the Zaner Bloser method. I'm going to be honest. I've never heard this spoken out loud, so I could have just mispronounced that. So this was created a few years after the Palmer method um, became much more common in the 20th century. Um, there's a little excerpt here. Um, it, it's, how do I put this? Um, there's a decreased emphasis on thick and thin strokes. So as you would get like with a nib. Um, so you, you can kind of see some thicker um, ascenders and descenders in the example, but generally there's not much emphasis on that. Next slide, please. So I just zoomed in. They're very very similar, the Palmer and Zener Bloser, um, but they they were developed separately. Next slide, please. So this might be Zener Bloser. <laughs> this is another Gallic document. Um, after I took these pictures, I was sort of trying to match them up to different uh, styles that might have existed around the same time. So I'm not sure. And if you gave me a document. I might not be able to say, oh yes, yeah, so this is this particular style or that, but it helps to just be familiar with different ways in which people wrote their letters. Next slide, please. So regardless of what style you're looking at, or if you're looking at hand, handwriting or print, um, you're still going to get in this period a non-standard spelling, especially like really Throughout the 1700s into the 1800s, um, there's going to be some, there will be some interesting uh, variations in how things are spelled. So sometimes you got to sound it out and try to try try to guess. Um, so and actually, you'll see in this image here on this slide, um, it's it's a comedy. This is a title page. Um, the first word acted. There's a ligature between C and T. So that's that's an example of a ligature in print. Um, you'll still see um, into the 1800s, the long S versus the round S. The round S is what we use now. Um, the long S is what looks like a lowercase f. So you'll see both examples in this, um, in this image here. Um, because the, the, like the long S wasn't used at the end of words or, and it didn't have a cap, a, a majuscule or capital version. So you'll see them both used in different, in different contexts. Um, so sometimes you will try be trying to say like Massachusetts as Massachusetts <laughs> if you if you see some, see it written with the long s, and then there's also cross writing. So if you go to the next slide, please. The image of cross writing, which is just to save paper when you run out of paper, um, you just 
rotate it 90 degrees and keep writing. Um, so that's not fun, <laughs> but uh, that is, you know, paper was expensive and uh, posting things was expensive. So you'll see in correspondence cross writing sometimes. And the only advice I have for, for reading it is just to go really slowly. It's going to take a long time, but the, you know, as you familiarize yourself with that person's handwriting and focus on each word, you will eventually get through it. But yeah, it is a nightmare when you first look at it. Next slide, please. This is an anecdote. Um, so just to show that I'm not an expert, uh, but I'm but I but I persevere. So um, this is an image uh, from a collection that I've been working on. Uh, so I was unframing all of these. Uh, photographic portraits that were in really bad like moldy frames and along the along the, the curve of the mat the name of the people these two, two people in this picture was written um and I was like what, 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 the hell? <laughs> what on earth is his name so I thought that last name was probably was like d-o-u-e-l something like that duel it has a little um diuresis on, on it the two dots um and I was like Zoldi uh, and actually, I, I don't, you can't see it in this, in this crop of the picture, but I assume the first name was William. It looks kind of like a William, but then my boss kind of thought it looked like a Hilton, like the, the, it was like, is it a W? Is it an H? We're not really sure. So I did all, a ton of research looking for any variations on any of these names, uh, going in ancestry, going through birth records, uh, trying to see like you know, if uh, what names existed in the late 1900s, because I, I knew that this was roughly 1890s, what names existed that this could be? <laughs> and I was just stuck for ages. So next slide, please. So I asked around, um, I ended up posting on Twitter. I was like, hey, any, any thoughts? And so someone said, I think that that Z name is, is Zoltan. Z-O-L-T-A-N. And I had assumed that was the woman's name because I thought the first name was William. Well, it turns out um, actually, oh, and I, oh, it doesn't show up in, in this particular article. As soon as I started searching for that, I find the last name is D-O-E-M-E. -E. There's no L involved at all. And it is Zoltan or Zolan. I see his name written both ways. And the name that I thought was William was Lillian. Lillian Nordica was an opera singer. So was Zolan. Doim. I'm not actually sure how you pronounce it. So I, so as soon as I had a second opinion, I realized I, I, I was able to come up with this new newspaper article and these two people almost immediately. It took like half an hour after that. So sometimes if you're, you just need a second pair of eyes who are going to look at, look at a word differently, or maybe have a different cultural context. Um, they who are more familiar with, uh, like in this case, the, this is the, um, excuse me, this singer has a, a Polish name. So someone who has experience looking at names from a culture that you're less familiar with might be able to identify a handwritten version of that. Next slide, please. So some other strategies for figuring out what it is that you're reading. Um, tracing or replicating uh, the just the curves that you're looking at. Um, so maybe you look you look at, at um, the document and then on a separate piece of paper, you've got, um, you're, you're trying to trace the same loops as your eyes. Um, and I don't know if you can see it in the video, but if you hold two pencils uh, close together, and write with them, that will give you an approximation of what it's like to write with a nib, more of a square nib, but you're gonna get the, the thick and thin outlines of each letter. Um, look for similar letters. Like if you, if you see a really clear word, like for example, in, um, in, in this slide, um, you can see there's the word Ireland. So you see, okay, that's how this person makes their A's. So if you see a word later on and you're not sure, if, if you're trying to decide between a couple of letters, look and see how that person has written that letter in other instances. Um, look for context clues. Sometimes you're like, I don't know what this word is supposed to be written as or how it's spelled, but just based on context, I can figure out what it is or what it's likely to be. Read out loud 
try to sound things out, you know, because maybe maybe someone spelled something wrong. And uh, but once you start sounding it out, you realize what it's supposed to be. Next slide, please. Um, especially in earlier writing, you're going to find some really long sentences, uh, even in like newspapers. So if you're like reading, 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 okay, this is this person's still going, there's lots of commas, there's lots of uh, prepositional phrases. Uh, it would be a nightmare to try to diagram this sentence. Find the verb and then find, you know, the subject, the object, and you'll start to figure out what's the core of this sentence. What are the additional phrases? What is the meaning here? Um, there's also time context that you can look for, um, particularly with correspondence. Uh, so that can help with um, dating correspondence and figuring out what order things go in and the just what was happening in these people's lives at that time. So if someone refers to say, um, instant, like I got your um, your letter on the 16th instant, that means the the most immediate of this month. Ultimo means like last month, proximo is the next month. So these little these little Latin terms um, indicate movement through time. Next slide, please. So if you want to know more, um, a couple of great sources. Um, I actually have this book, Mastering Calligraphy. So it is, uh, it's designed for, for artists, people who want to learn calligraphy, um, it's so there but there's it's got really good historical context and it's got really nice illustrations so you can see the letter forms and it's it's a thick book it's got a lot of visual detail so you can learn different letter forms and it and it goes back farther than than I have today so this goes back to the Roman and medieval periods next slide please so the universal penman um by George Bickham so this is uh one of the sources for that that was published to teach uh, roundhand and copper plate, um, and these next couple of ones are our primary sources. And if you get an account on archive.org, which is free, you can check these out and actually look at the whole version. And um, some of the images I've used in this presentation are taken from these books. Next slide, please. So um, the Palmer method of business writing. So, uh, you know, because this was designed for people to use in order to be better clerks or secretaries, there, there are handbooks on how to do the Palmer method. Um, kind of like learning to take a keyboarding class, uh, learning, learning how to type. Uh, this was a, a method, a course that you, that you could learn. Next slide, please. So, okay, I couldn't remember how many books, books I had. So those are available on archive.org. Um, and I mean, there are there are a ton of books about calligraphy that aren't necessarily about um, the history or um, different contextual circumstances that led to the development of different forms of writing, but learning calligraphy will help you read it. I'm not saying that everyone has to do that, but if you have any interest, definitely try it. It's it can be quite fun. So um, yeah, I'm I'm open for questions. Um, and I think we're going to talk about fall webinars as well. So think about things you want to ask me. And uh, yeah, sorry, Emma, Emma, go ahead. So we've got three more webinars happening this fall, and we'll take questions in just a second. Um, the next one is actually next Monday, and we're going to talk about how to do interactive exhibits. Um, so kind of how to do things with tablets and other things for small museums and historical societies. That's a Monday. If you go to our website slash webinars, you can register. Um, in December, I've moved a couple of these around. Um, we're going to talk about how to use city directories for genealogy research. Um, so that's in December. And then in January, we're going to do a webinar on how to use Facebook for small museums. Um, I know personally, I kind of look at, face, at Facebook as the yellow pages post-pandemic because it's kind of where you're going to find new events and updated hours, whereas not everybody's, everybody like changed their hours like five times during the pandemic. I feel like Facebook's always the place to find the updated hours. Anyways, um, those are our fall webinars. So interactive exhibits is next Monday. Um, and we'll just kind of talk about how to 
how to make things, you know, like with tablets and how to engage your audience while they're in your exhibit. Um, and then we'll talk about genealogy and city directories in December. Um, and then right now we don't have the chat open, but if you have any questions for Jenna, um, feel free to unmute or raise your hand and we can start kind of doing some questions. I always see in these genealogy like Facebook groups, like people will post photos of things and then say, what is what is this? Or what does this letter say? Kind of like what Jenna said she did on Twitter. Um, and so we did a webinar about this in June because all these responses, I didn't see any strategies. And I mean, like it's a community like crowdsource thing. Um, so that's kind of where I thought like this would be very informative. And then um, kind of just zeroing in on like, if I have like a great, great grandmother's like letter, it's like from the 1800s. And so that's why we zeroed in on 19th century on this one. Um, so we can't help you find, read what anything says today, but if you have any questions about strategies or about a certain method, we can discuss that. Hello. Hi, hi, hi Anne. I can hear you. Okay. Um, I have something, a question that's puzzled me for many decades. My grandmother and her sister, they were born in 1885 and 1888, went to a finishing school in, uh, in Louisville. Mm -hmm. Around 1900, they both had a handwriting that I have never seen anywhere else. It is a back slanted to the left okay. handwriting, and it was very loopy. And the N's and the M's all looked like W's and U's. Um, it was you know, I mean, I grew up reading her handwriting. So eventually I could read it um, because I read it a lot. Do you know anything about, was this a specific kind of handwriting that was taught to proper young ladies at that time? Or was it regional? Or do you have any clue? So I don't know if there's a name for it, um, but I have seen some handwriting like that before, particularly with the M's look kind of looking like W's. I've seen that a lot with actually, um, I used to work for a Catholic university and, I, and some of the earlier documents written by sisters kind of had some of that. Um, I also I wonder if- Baptist, that was there. So I don't think they went to- <laughs> Yeah, but but yeah, but who knows who knows knows if the nuns also went to finishing school. <laughs> That's uh, true. And you know, there, there's also a chance that there is a little bit of a, but because it's a finishing school, more of like a European influence. Like I've I've noticed even with handwriting today from like a friend of mine who's Italian, her A's look kind of like O's, and I don't I don't know I don't know exactly like what generated that letter form. Um, but there are, there can be some differences in how um, Europeans and Americans uh, make their letters. But I think there also could be, the, like as you said, um, some regional specificity. Um, but like, like I said, I, I don't know if there is a name for that specific handwriting, but I have definitely seen that. Um, and you know, there could be their calligraphy master might have been. Um, trying to train them towards a more elegant form, you know, it, it perhaps it was beautiful. It was beautiful to, to look at. It was beautiful. It, it was yeah, just so, impossible to read. Yeah. So perhaps trying to re retain that elegance amid the rise of business writing. I'm just kind of, and I mean, I'm just kind of, I'm just guessing, but I have, I have seen some things kind of like that before. You're in a better position to make a guess than I am because my whole family, we've all puzzled about it for decades. I mean, she died in 1972. So that's well, really interesting. And I mean, obviously, like I just covered a couple of basic ones, but it would be really interesting to get really into some some hyper specific um handwritings. There in the book, 
I think it's in the book, not just the TV show, The Alienist, which is like a murder, a murder mystery, psychological thriller set um, around the turn of the century in New York. They actually identify a killer based on some very hyper specific type of handwriting that they had that would have only been taught between sc in schools between like these two periods. I'm not sure if it was real or if it was made up for the purposes of the novel, but uh, it's interesting to think about how regional specificity could lead to that type of identification possibly. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Question, does the, the writer being left-handed or right-handed significantly impact the style if they've been taught that style? Oh, good question. Well, you know, it's funny, my, I have an uncle who in school, they would actually, uh, it, he was left-handed they would tie his hand behind his back um so and i so i don't know the the, the breakdown of right hand, righties and lefties in the 19th century um but i do know that people were encouraged to write with their right hands um certainly um ink smearing is much more of a worry if you are left-handed and i know that in palmer and i think some of the business styles there is a not only the the letter form and hand motions are specified in the manual but also the angle you have your paper at mm -hmm. which would change based on whether you're right or left-handed um right. i don't know about, like letter forms or like if you can tell if someone's right or left-handed by by how they make their letters um but some of the man the manuals might have some different instructions for righties and lefties yeah, I, I, I'm a, of an age where I remember those, you know, the the different instructions for rights or left-handers, and um, and then I've seen people who to prevent that smear, of uh, you know, have really contorted their hand across the top of their writing, um, yeah. but um, yeah, I just was wondering if if that if that changed the like the the pitch of the 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 lean of the letters um you know, yeah, can. yeah yeah okay and different different hands will specify like different angles at which you're supposed to hold your pen especially in a lot of the different decorative calligraphic styles mm -hmm. uh, so and and like how wide your pen nib should be for the size of the letter that you're trying to make um and so and all of that would vary a little bit uh mm -hmm right or left-handedness um yeah I am right-handed so I've never tried writing left-handed with a nib or a dip pen but I imagine it's quite difficult <laughs> thank you you're welcome I'm just gonna comment that uh, your tips are good about um unusual names we've been doing some transcribing of old birth death and marriage records in our county and they're from the 1870s, 80s, 90s that are handwritten. And we would run across names that would seem odd, but we weren't really sure. And you just Google search and, you know, put in such a, what you think it is and put in man's name in the Google search. You'll find, oh, this is a common French man's name or yeah. German man's name. Because we get immigrants from all over the place in these records. So there's there's cultures that have first names and last names. I'm not last names is not so useful for, but first names for sure. I, you know, found some that I didn't know were were legitimate names, and then we got the spelling right, at least we hope. And the other thing is, as we're going through these and we're having trouble deciphering a letter, we'll look at at other writing on the same page because we'll usually have sections of the books that are written by the same clerk, or they'll switch back and forth between a couple different clerks, and you get to kind of know their writing, and you can say, oh, okay. This is how this person makes their O's or their Q's or their, you know, S's or whatever it is. And so I look for other instances, or if I can't read it in the child's name, I go across the page and look at the father's and mother's name, and they'll have the last name repeated. And yeah. hopefully I can decipher it better maybe in the father's name column than I can in the child's name column. Yeah. So sometimes just all those clues about looking in the same document if you have a big enough sample it doesn't help when it's one name written on the back of a photo but yeah. when you have when you have a document like these ledgers you know you've got a lot of samples of the writing yeah and sometimes uh even the spelling of someone's name wasn't really standardized um especially oh, sure. yeah 
um especially like in early america um i have an ancestor whose name is philemon or philomene we're not really sure because she was french canadian she was illiterate so i don't think she had she had a preference um and different censuses recorded her name in different ways but uh based on like obituaries of other people in her family she went by flora did not go by whatever that name was um but because it was a foreign name always being recorded by uh english speakers it was always spelled a little bit different and right. obviously- as, as we're putting in these names and we're putting in the the, ch- the parents' names, we built a search. You can search by parent name rather, you know, father, mother rather than child. And I'll search, I'll search a, f- a father's name or, you know, maybe a fairly unusual last name. And I'll find six children born that are pretty clearly the same family because the parents' names are similar enough and the, the ages are close enough. But, you know, in, not in not in any two are the same fathers and mothers' versions of their name the same. They spell yeah. them wrong. They, you know, different people write it down different times. It's, it's not consistent whatsoever. Yeah, I've, I ran into that with a particular project that was um, materials for the 18th century. And I ended up not, we ended up not finishing the project. It, it's neither here nor there, or there, but uh, we thought about having some sort of controlled vocabulary so that we knew like, these are all variations in how this person's name is spelled. We never enacted it, but if you have a, a specific set of records to uh, to enact that with that, and that would be useful. Or if yeah, you just, we, know that you're not to recognize that. We just ended up writing in our instructions to, you know, caution people, make sure you just use the put in part of the name and use a wild card. Don't, don't expect it to be in there the same way every time. Use a partial search because you don't know. And we did, we decided early on as we're transcribing this, we're going to put it down the way it's written in the record as best we can read it. We're not going to attempt to correct it to match the kids yeah. from two years ago because then, you know, we might not be getting any of it right that way. So we're just kind of taking it as best we can. Yeah. There's definitely a, a lack of certainty that you get with, I mean, like handwriting is so creative and I mean, sometimes, you know, I can't even read my own handwriting, but we're never going to really know exactly why someone made a letter a certain way or spelled something a certain way or why they're, so it's, I guess I'm just trying to say that because writing is a creative exercise, so is reading it sometimes. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, we'll end here. Um, I will send out this video later this week. If you find us um, on YouTube at Backlog Archivist, you can subscribe and feel free to share it with anybody. Um, And then next week we have the webinar on interactive exhibits, Um, but I hope to see some of you there. And thank you, Jenna. And thank you everybody for, for sticking with us. Jenna, your knowledge is so impressive. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm-hmm. It thank is. You. And thank you for offering this um, seminar, Emma. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night, everybody.